kind of known that for you know, quite a few years. Um, WHO, the World Health Organization, and UN group, urges farmers to stop using antibiotics in healthy animals. Again, why do they use antibiotics in healthy animals? It's a growth promoter, right? Uh, why we need a, a culture of international collaboration to fight antibiotic resistance. Um, and I haven't read this last one, but honeybees could play a role in developing new antibiotics. Which, not if they're all dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> Colony collapse disorder. All right, so that was, you know, this is what I get every day. Which is why I have thousands of emails I haven't read. So that's, uh, and why sometimes I'm slow at answering your emails. Sometimes. Let's get out of that. All right, let's uh, continue on with today's lecture then. Uh, we're finishing up uh, engineering and uh, looking at engineering of uh, plants, the various methodologies involved. Uh, eventually we'll get there. Here we go. All right, uh, and what we talked about in the past, whether we're using Agrobacterium tumefaciens uh, or the gene gun, physical method for moving DNA in plants, typically you're moving the gene into the uh, plant cell genome, especially with Agrobacterium because that's how it's designed. Uh, but with the gene gun, again, typically you're moving the gene into the plant genome. But there are advantages to moving your gene of interest into the chloroplast. And so people are looking at chloroplast engineering. All right, uh, again, most uh, plant genes you find in the genome, but there are uh, you know, plant genes in the chloroplast and also the mitochondria. And people forget about that, but uh, uh, there are you know, genes in those two organelles because, again, they're what? Why? Why is there DNA in those organelles? Endosymbiosis. Yeah, the endosymbiotic theory. All right, so if we want to move the gene into the chloroplast, then we've got a couple methods of doing it. Uh, add chloroplast targeting signal peptide to your gene that you put in the human genome so that when your, your protein is made, that targeting signal will get the protein uh, taken up into the chloroplast. So your gene isn't in the chloroplast genome, but the protein ends up in the chloroplast. All right, and the second is what we're going to spend our time talking about is uh, putting the transgene, uh, you know, our foreign gene, our gene of interest, directly in the chloroplast genome. All right, so why do we want to do that? If we have methods that we can get the gene into the, the plant genome, why do we want to put it in the chloroplast genome? Well, basically, it's one of the advantages is that it's a copy number issue. Uh, in uh, plant cells, there are anywhere from 50 to 100 chloroplasts per cell, and there are anywhere from 10 to 100 copies of the chloroplast genome per chloroplast. So if you want a copy number, you know, if you want to put it in the chloroplast genome. If you take even the lower level, uh, you know, 50 chloroplasts, 10 copies per, you've got 500 copies of your gene if it goes into each chloroplast genome once. If you go at the high end, you know, 100 times 100 is what, 10,000? So 10,000 copies of your gene, that should give you a pretty high level of expression. Probably too much, but... Uh, <clears throat> so again, copy number, the one big advantage. Uh, the second uh, <clears throat> is a... a um, Important reason, uh, because one of the drawbacks uh, of putting your gene in the plant genome is that it ends up in both, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be uh, in the gamete, so it'll be in both the pollen and the egg. And pollen can be distributed widely, depending on what plant you're talking about. But if it's in the chloroplast, for most of the crop plants, uh, the pollen doesn't contain chloroplast. All right, now that's not true of all plants. Um, I think some of the uh, pines or firs or you know, some plants do have chloroplasts in the pollen. But if you're concerned about distribution of your transgene, then putting it in the chloroplast genome because of its maternal inheritance, which we skip in 311, uh, <clears throat> your, your, your transgene will only be passed on 
uh, you know, from the mother through the through the egg, and so it won't be distributed in the pollen. So it won't be distributed to uh, other farmers' fields. All right. So how do we get the gene into the chloroplast genome? Uh, basically, we have to do it using the gene gun. All right, our micro, our biolistic method, the microprojectile method, and you have to hit a chloroplast. All right. Now. The gene gun is horribly inefficient as it is, and, it, and the nucleus is you know, gigantic compared with the size of the chloroplast. All right, so uh, it becomes extremely inefficient trying to get your gene into uh, a chloroplast. So we need selectable markers, and typically what's done is you put the chloroplast selectable marker on one plasmid, you put the target gene on a second plasmid, and then uh, you hope for homologous recombination uh, with the chloroplast DNA that's on those plasmids to, to get it into the, the, the mm -hmm. gene of interest. All right, or you can put both genes on the same plasmid. So here's the idea is for gene or uh, selectable marker for the chloroplast, flanking sequences, and you know, this will move it into uh, the chloroplast uh, gene. All right. Uh, there are a number of chloroplast selectable markers and reported genes that we can use. They're listed here. Uh, again, it's not all that important. It's just knowing that, yes, we have selectable markers where we can select for uh, you know, the, the transgene being carried along with the uh, selectable marker gene. Uh, again, not easy, but uh, the benefits may outweigh the difficulty of generating those because lots of people are concerned with uh, transgenes being distributed widely in the environment, although, you know, if you're dealing with corn, uh, you know, what's the closest relative of corn? There really isn't anything because it's been engineered. So the corn pollen isn't going to, you know, the only thing corn pollen will pollinate is other corn. And the only problem would arise if there are uh, you know, organic farmers are growing non-GMO uh, corn, uh, and you know they would get kind of irate if uh, <clears throat> you know their seed was now genetically modified. All right, <clears throat> all right. So let's move on. Then our next topic is reporter genes, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> again, we've been talking about this the biolistic method uh, as well as the agrobacterium method are pretty inefficient, uh, only a few target genes are going to be transformed, so often you want a way of uh, being able to select for the cells that have been transformed. It's like antibiotic resistance, and, uh, you know, with bacteria, you plate them on the media that contains an antibiotic, the one that has the resistance gene will grow and form colonies. It's basically the same thing. So for plant systems, what do we have in terms of reporter genes and selectable markers? All right, for selectable markers, you know, if you think about this, uh, in bacteria, we're using antibiotics, and the function of antibiotics is to kill the bacteria. So your selectable marker gene is an antibiotic resistance gene. So we can think about our selection system for plants, and we can use basically the same thing, antibiotics. Some antibiotics will kill plant cells, so we can use those. And the other major type of selection agent that we have for plants are herbicides, right? Herbicide, plant killer, right? So if we have herbicide resistance genes, we can, uh, you know, plate our, you know, bombarded cells on media that contains, you know, the appropriate herbicide. If the herbicide resistance gene has gone in, it's the same as, as plating uh, bacteria that have taken up plasmids on media that contain an antibiotic. The ones that pick up the herbicide resistance gene will grow, the ones that don't won't grow. All right, now for reporter enzymes, uh, the requirements are listed here. Uh, ideally, you want something that's uh, you know, an acid very easily performed. You think back to the lysis, what we use. Alkaline phosphatase, horseradish peroxidase, why? Uh, easily performed, little to no activity in the non-transformed cells, and low cost. All right, well, it's the same thing here, except 
you, know, you can't use alkaline phosphatase with horseradish peroxidase because plants have those sorts of uh, activities and enzymes. All right, so this is the table from your book, 18.5, but I uh, photoshopped it to rearrangement, rearrange it so that we group the agents that would be the selection. So the antibiotic resistance genes are here, the herbicide resistance genes, and then other genes that function as reporter enzymes. So if you want to measure how much expression you're getting from a particular uh, enzyme, uh, you would use one of those. You can't select for these, but you can at least measure how much activity you have in that particular tissue. Uh, well, at least some of them you can, but nobody ever uses those as selection. They're going to use antibiotics and herbicides. So the antibiotics, basically the same ones we've been talking about with uh, bacterial systems. Herbicides, uh, they list the specific enzyme here, um, and again, it's not all that important. All right, uh, for the reporter enzymes, the big three uh, for <coughs> plants are listed here. Uh, the beta D glucuronidase, uh, it's the UIDA gene, everybody calls it GUS uh, <coughs> for the glucuronidase, and then the luciferase, LUC, primarily fireflies, some people use the bacterial one, and then uh, the different fluorescent proteins, primarily green fluorescent protein, but there are others, red and, and yellow as well. Uh, here's a, an example of uh, luciferase as a uh, reporter gene. This is a plant that was transformed with the luciferase gene under the control of a constitutive promoter, so it's expressed in all tissues. Uh, and then the plant was dumped into a solution of uh, luciferin. So the luciferin was taken up into the plant and then distributed through the vascular system of the plant. Uh, and then, you know, this is a long exposure. It's not glowing, uh, but it's a, a long exposure. But you can see the uh, activity pretty much uh, wherever the luciferin could get in high enough concentrations to actually produce significant light. Uh, other reporter uh, <coughs> sorts of systems, this is uh, GFP expression in a root tip. So again, depending on what promoter you're using, you know, in the previous slide it was expressed everywhere, but you detected primarily in vascular systems because that's where your substrate was. But if you have a, a promoter driving expression of GFP that is, is expressed only in specific cell types, like this particular layer, then that's where you'll detect it. All right, and now we're nice segue into promoters, right? After 20 years, I finally figured out how to do that. All right, so let's look at promoters because this is uh, important for a, a number of reasons. All right, because the promoters are really going to drive expression, both of the selectable markers as well as our reporter genes and our gene of interest. Okay. Now, typically you want constitutive expression of your marker gene, right, the selectable marker, because uh, <clears throat> you, it needs to be expressed all the time while you're carrying out selection uh, until you have your transgenic uh, tissues in your transgenic plant. Uh, the, the target genes and, and maybe even the reporter gene can either be regulated in some fashion or in some cases they may also be under constitutive uh, expression. All right, uh, for constitutive expression, there are a few promoters that are widely used. Uh, this uh, cauliflower mosaic virus promoter uh, drives expression of the 35S RNA, it's analogous to the uh, you know, 16 and, and what, 23S RNAs in bacteria, the 18 and 28S RNAs in uh, you know, it's the, the size of that particular RNA. And this is generally used in dicots, although it does work, um, you know, versions of it work in monocots. But in monocots, typically the rice actin promoter and the maize ubiquitin promoter. And I actually developed the maize ubiquitin promoter back when I was a postdoc. All right, now that's constitutive expression. So those promoters will drive expression of you know, whatever gene is downstream in pretty much all tissues at some level. But we also 
probably will want regulated expression, especially of our gene of interest, because if we want a uh, you know some toxin that will kill insects that start feeding on the plant and it's found in the soil, then we want you know to drive expression of that in the soil and not in the rest of the plant. All right, so developmental expression, maybe it should be expressed early in development, maybe it should be expressed only late in development. Tissue specific, expressed in the root, the leaf, pollen, seed, you know, where do we want our gene of interest expressed? Uh, do we want it light regulated? Do we want it regulated by stress, such that it turns on when there's uh, too much salt around, not enough water, too much heat, all right? Uh, and you know potentially hormone regulated, right? As maybe a defense mechanism from uh, you know, insects uh, preying on on neighboring plants. All right, all right. Any questions on that? This is out of order, but we're still on the last one. Any questions before we go on? All right, let's talk about uh, marker-free transgenic plants. All right. Now, the, the markers, the selectable markers that we're talking about are primarily antibiotic resistance and herbicide resistance, all right? And those genes, along with the gene of interest, are carried along when you make a transgenic plant, right? Now, typically, uh, you know, in all the studies that have been done, there are no adverse effects on humans, animals, or the environment to having those genes present in the proteins that are made from those genes. But uh, you know, people aren't rational, and there are concerns that having uh, you know, antibiotic resistance genes in you know, Roundup-ready soybeans will increase the likelihood of getting antibiotic resistance bacteria. Or that if you eat um, hamburger helper because it has uh, uh, you know, soybean meal in it, you will consume that gene and you will transform your bacteria in your gut and now you will be antibiotic resistant. Uh, and the other is uh, you know, that people might be resistant to these proteins even though typically the levels of these proteins is fairly low in the transgenic plant. Uh, so those are sort of the negatives, you know, in terms of, of uh, what the consumer worries about the markers, genes, and, and marker enzyme. Uh, for the plant biotechnologist, uh, if you have a marker gene in your plant, then if you want to stack traits, you've already made it resistant to a herbicide, but you want to add a gene that's going to make it um, resistant to salt. Or some other environmental stress, then you would have to uh, use a different selectable marker. All right, if you want to add a third trait, then you need a third selectable marker. So when you stack traits, you're also stacking selectable marker genes, and you know that becomes more difficult the more you add. So uh, to eliminate the problem, you know you, you want to get rid of the. Uh, <clears throat> antibiotic or herbicide resistance gene, all right? Now, there are also new selectable markers being developed that don't rely on antibiotic or herbicide resistance. These are often involved in, in uh, different uh, carbon sources that the plant relies on, all right? And that you can add a gene that will allow a plant cell to grow on, say, mannitol, but not uh, you know, so the, the transformed tissue will grow, the non-transformed tissue won't. Because remember, we're growing uh, in the initial transformation, these are undifferentiated cells. They're callous cells, typically. So they're not photosynthetic. So they're relying on a carbon source in the media, typically glucose or sucrose. Uh, but if we substitute something that normally isn't metabolized by the plant cell, like mannose or mannitol, we have to add the gene that will allow the plant to utilize it. And that's sort of where they're going with these new selectable markers. All right, so let's <clears throat> move on. So if we're back to using herbicide and antibiotic resistance gene, how can we make marker-free transgenic plants? There's a couple of different strategies. And one is to put the two genes 
the selectable marker gene, whether it's herbicide resistance or antibiotic resistance, and your gene of interest on two plasmids, right? And then using the biolistic method, coat both plasmids on your gold particles and shoot them both into the plant cells. So on our, our two plasmids, one will contain the selectable marker, one contains the target gene. You shoot them into the plant cells and somewhere between 30 and 80% of the, the transformed cells will have both genes. All right. So you're selecting for the ones that contain the selectable marker gene, then you'll have to screen through those to find out which ones also have your gene of interest, the target gene. All right. Now, typically these are going to be, uh, you know, they're going to in integrate into the plant genome uh, separately. All right. There'll be you know, individual uh, integration sites, so there'll be two integration sites. And once you regenerate your plant, you can use conventional breeding then to separate those. All right. Chromosome, uh, <coughs> random assortment of chromosomes. So we can't get rid of conventional breeding, uh, but you know, we can utilize it. All right. Uh, the second one is a little bit different uh, in that you're going to put the selectable marker gene uh, between plant transposable elements, what are called DS elements. These are natural uh, elements found in maize, uh, and they're uh, responsible for uh, you know, certain maize elements that uh, transpose from one site to another. Uh, now, because of, of the nature of these elements, we also need the transposase gene. The transposase gene will act on the DS elements and whatever is between them and move it to a new location. So, uh, and ideally, if the new location is on another chromosome, uh, then we can use conventional breeding to separate the two. All right, so here's one example of this. So here's our selectable marker gene, the DS elements of these uh, gold boxes, our transposase gene, and the gene of interest. Now, you could also put the transposase gene, you know, you could have a, a move this DS element over here. All right, because then you would move both the selectable marker and the transposase gene, and you'd just be left with the gene of interest. All right, but you know, if you're doing this in corn, the transposase gene is a natural corn protein, so nobody should argue with that because we've been eating it for what 10,000 years, right? So in the grass generally recognized as safe. All right, and here's a, a second method that's uh, sort of the same thing, but uh, slightly different. There's a recombinase gene and some uh, recombination-specific sequences here. And again, here the recombinase gene and the selectable marker are uh, you know, bordered by these recombination sequences. So when you express the recombinase gene, uh, the enzyme will move the recombinase gene as well as the selectable marker to a new site. And again, then you can use conventional breeding uh, to separate the target gene from uh, your selectable marker. All right, now these would be like second and, and third generation. I don't think uh, any of these are on the market yet. All right, and theoretically you can do something similar in chloroplasts. If you put repetitive DNA on either side of the selectable marker gene, you can get homologous recombination occurring between those repeats, and that will pop the selectable marker gene out of the chloroplast genome, and then it'll be lost. And again, then you've separated the target gene from the selectable marker. All right, any questions on those? All right, and again, the reason you want to do this is that uh, if we go back, is that uh, a lot of people have concerns about you know these genes and proteins being present in the, the plants and in the foodstuffs that people eat. Uh, you know, if also being spread into the environment theoretically as well. Uh, if your pollen contains herbicide resistance genes and it's being spread to 
uh, you know, what, weedy wild relatives, then you know potentially they can become resistant. Any questions? So you know, it's best to get rid of uh, those particular types of markers. All right, I think that's it for methodology. So let's look now at applications that uh, deal with plants overcoming uh, plant stress, both uh, biotic, you know, living types of stress, and abiotic, more environmental types of stress. Again, our outline sort of here will probably uh, abbreviate this somewhat, uh, but we'll try and cover at least the highlights of these. All right. Um, so engineering insect resistance in plants. Uh, insects cause uh, major damage to uh, major losses to crops throughout the world uh, and you know, farmers use chemical insecticides to kill the insects but uh, chemical insecticides are broad spectrum. They'll kill basically anything in the field uh, and eventually what's going to happen? They're going to become resistant, and then what do you do? Develop another one that's stronger, kill that one. All right, so it's sort of the never-ending cycle here uh, when you're dependent on chemical insecticides. Uh, but again, because they're broad spectrum, you kill the good insects along with the bad. Right. Uh, note the amount spent, 10, uh, 15 to 20 billion just in, in 2007. All right, now, if we move to biological insecticides, typically these are highly specific, all right? That the, because it's, we're dealing with biology and not chemistry, uh, the biological aspect is going to target a particular type of insect, right? And we can kill that insect, and hopefully not harm humans and, and uh, you know, the rest of the wildlife and the environment. Uh, and what people have found is that in cases where biological insecticides are used, there's actually less fungal infection in the plants, in the crop plants. And it's believed that uh, insects feeding on plants um, provide sites for fungal infection of those plants. So if you can get rid of the specific insects that are chewing on your plant, uh, then you're uh, going to have less uh, fungal problems in your crop as well. All right, uh, the main strategy that uh, <clears throat> plant molecular biologists have used to develop insect resistance in plants is the Bt toxin, right? Uh, in, back in 2007, 40 million hectares, that's what, uh, 80 plus million, 90 million acres uh, have been pl planted with uh, Bt engineered crops worldwide. It's much, much higher than that now. All right, and why do we want to do this? Uh, all right, this is one of the major insect pests in the U.S., the uh, cotton bollworm, which uh, chews a hole in the, basically the bud of the cotton plant, crawls inside, and eats all of the inside of the, the bowl, the flower, uh, and that's where the cotton should be. All right, but the insect, uh, larvae eats it all, and so you basically don't uh, get any crop. All right. So again, the main strategy is the uh, Bt toxin from the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. This is what organic farmers use to put on their uh, you know, cabbage and broccoli. I use it, you know, Bt toxin as a spore. Uh, and it kills you know, the, the cabbage uh, butterfly larva and other sorts of things. There are other strategies. We're not really going to talk about those. They're, again, targeted to killing the insects that are eating the plant. So they're not going to affect other insects that aren't eating the plant. All right. Uh, for the Bt toxin, uh, the toxin is a, a protein uh, that's ingested by the insect feeding on the plant. So. You know, if you're an organic farmer, you're going to sprinkle the spores that contain the toxic protein on the plants. 
uh, when the insects eat the, the plant, they're eating the spore as well, and they end up dying. In the case of the genetically engineered plants, the plant cells are producing the protein, so when the insect feeds on the plant, they're going to eat the toxin and ultimately die. The toxin is activated in the insect gut. Uh, insect guts are alkaline, and uh, alkali conditions plus specific proteins in the insect gut uh, break the toxin down into the toxic peptide. It inserts into the epithelial cell membrane, uh, forms ion channels. So, you know, the hemoseal on the insect is sort of leaking into the gut. The, uh, the, the bacteria that, uh, you know, are present, well, the, the spores and, and other bacteria that are present infect the hemocyl and end up killing the insect, basically is what happens. All right, <clears throat> again, Bt toxin doesn't persist in the environment. Uh, you have to, if you're an organic farmer, you sprinkle it on like every three days or so, depending on uh, you know, the weather. If it rains, then you probably have to add it sooner. Again, not harmful to humans, mammals, or birds, primarily because the toxin isn't activated in our guts because our guts are acidic. We also don't have the specific proteases, nor do we have the specific receptors. All right. Okay. All right, so again, this is sort of what happens. Uh, the toxin is, is in a perisporal crystal, and then when the insect eats this, the alkali breaks it down into protoxins. The toxins then are cleaved with specific proteases to form the active toxin. Right. The toxin inserts into the epithelial cell membrane of the gut, uh, and you form the, these ion channels that allow nutrients to flow uh, you know, outside the cell into the gut, where there are bacteria, the bacteria grow, and they actually can infect the hemocyl as well through the, the pores and end up killing the insect. All right, now, <clears throat> um, the, the Bt toxin is not a single protein. There are lots and lots of different uh, Bt toxins. Uh, different strains of Bacillus thuringiensis produce slightly different versions of the Bt toxin. And so, you know, because we're dealing with biology here, the biology is very specific. If you're targeting a specific insect pest, you have to use the specific uh, Bt toxin. Right? If you want to target mosquito larvae, you're not going to use the Bt toxin that kills corn rootworm. Right? It's just not going to work because they're tailored towards each other. Uh, so, you know, the type of toxin gene, also the level of exposure. How much expression do you need in your corn plant to kill the corn rootworm that's chewing on your, your plant? And where do you want to express it? You know, can you express it just in the root? Do you you know, express it everywhere, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's happening. All right, and this table uh, from your text sort of illustrates some of that. Uh, the gene here, uh, again, you can see there are a lot of different uh, versions here, Cry1A, uh, the B, or the Cry1A, the A version, or the C version, and there's uh, Cry1B, and I don't know how many others. Uh, and then it's either uh, the full length or truncated, and it, can either be wild type, partially modified, meaning codon optimization uh, for the particular plant, or fully modified again, fully modified for that particular plant. Note that the expression level can vary significantly from uh, essentially not detected up to what's the highest here, 0.3. All right, and in some cases where you do have uh, you know some expression, you know you, you don't really have any insecticidal effect. So you, there is a threshold level where you have to be above it in order for there to be enough Bt toxin in the plant to kill the insect. Uh, right? You don't want the insect to eat the entire plant to get enough Bt toxin for it to die. That kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, although the, the first year of the uh, Bt cotton trial was like a, a perfect storm. Uh, they planted the Bt toxin, and apparently the weather was perfect for the cotton bowl. Uh, hot, dry conditions, and there were, you know, there were so many bollworms, um, you know, emerging from the eggs that they were, uh, 
destroying the cotton plants. The farmers ended up spraying with chemical insecticides anyway uh, because the, the damage was uh, going to be so great because there were so many of the, uh, the Bt toxins. All right, um, this one shows uh, specificity uh, as well as the ability of the Bt toxin to protect. So we're looking at three different insects here, tobacco hornworm, tomato foodworm, tomato pinworm, and then we're looking at either wild type plants or transgenic plants that are either treated with an insecticide, second and fourth column, or without insecticide. So if we look at wild type with no insecticide, uh, you know, this is percent damage, uh, significant damage. Uh, anywhere from 20% uh, percent up to 99.7. If you add insecticide, um, in the case of the tomato pinworm, the insecticide doesn't work. So you're spraying insecticide, you're killing lots of beneficial insects, but it doesn't do anything to the tomato pinworm. Right? Not very useful. All right, if we look at the transgenic ones, uh, no insecticide again, lots of damage, well, some damage, uh, but a lot with the tomato pinworm. Uh, <clears throat> but look at comparison of uh, you know, 1.5 versus 47, 6.4 versus 20. So the transgenic with the BT protects uh, reasonably well against tobacco hornworm and tomato fruitworm. But uh, in the case of, of the tomato pinworm, this particular BT isn't effective. You, know, you see roughly the same amount of damage, 90 plus percent, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the case of no insecticide. Think about how many plants have been made uh, transgenic with the BT gene. Um, two of them, I think, are on the market, and said, I think that's it. All right. So you know, when you read lots of uh, scare articles about Franken foods and things like that, uh, there really aren't very many uh, genetically modified plants that are in our food system. At least not yet. They're coming. Uh, potato, uh, there have been potatoes that were engineered to, uh, with BT to fight off the uh, uh, Colorado potato beetle, but I don't think those are on the market anymore. I know there's a squash now with BT. Yeah, with BT? Okay. All right. Again, the beetle goes faster than, than me. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. All right, so drawbacks. All right, drawbacks, uh, again, toxins show insect specificity. If we go back and look at our uh, tomato table here, uh, you know, what if we have all three of these? All right, then what's our strategy? For a different crop, right? <laughs> you know, while the, the BT that's in these transgenic tomato plants is effective against the tobacco hornworm and the tomato fruitworm, it's not effective against the pinworm. All right, so we would need to have a, a second BT gene or, or do something different if our tomato fields were infested with all three of these pests. Right? Because again, we're dealing with um, insect specificity. All right, and uh, again, continual exposure may result in resistance. Uh, BT toxin kills insects, and if that's a selection. Uh, if one survives because of some random mutation that allows you know, its gut receptor not to bind the BT toxin, then what's gonna happen? It's gonna survive, it's going to reproduce, and then boom, you've got everything resistant to that particular BT toxin and potentially others. So uh, scientists are, are aware of this and uh, there are a number of different strategies that people are trying to use uh, or at least have thought about, let me phrase it that way. One is to limit expression of the BT gene with an inducible promoter. So if you can rig up a promoter such that you turn on BT once the plant senses that there's an insect chewing on it, 
then <clears throat> you know, you're going to limit exposure. It's not going to be there all the time. It's only going to be expressed when the insect is feeding. Uh, if you fuse portions of two different Bt toxin genes, both of which are effective against your target insect, uh, you know, if, if there's one in a million chance, you've got one in a million and one in a million, you multiply those probabilities, one in 10 to the 12th. That's a pretty low probability of getting resistance. All right, uh, or do it a combination, BT with one of the other insecticidal genes that we didn't talk about. Uh, yeah, use low levels of chemical insecticides, which you know, we're trying to avoid doing to you know, protect the environment. Uh, and the strategy that people are using with more or less some success is the spatial refuge strategies. And in this, uh, there are areas of the field that are planted with non-transformed crop plants. And in fact, uh, in, in those areas, then there's no, in selection, no insect selection. And now, when you buy uh, hybrid seed corn that is transformed with BT, blended into it at 5 to 10 percent, uh, it is uh, non-BT. All right, so you're, you're, you don't have you know, these five acres over here. It's built into the field. It will have non-selection, all right? And that will aid in, in preventing insect resistance. Did you have a question? I was going to comment on that. When I bought my scary Monsanto corn, they advertised how it was blended and all that. Yeah. Monsanto. That's it right. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip this on protease inhibitors because it's uh, along the same line. Uh, it's a protease inhibitor. So when the insect eats it, it inhibits the proteases. And basically, the insects starve to death because they can't digest proteins. All right, so again, there's some predation on the plant, but uh, you're targeting only the insects that are eating the plant. You're not killing every insect. All right, uh, and again, constructs here. Uh, this is a binary vector. So binary vectors are going to have what? Right, they're going to have origins for both. They're going to have selectable markers for both. Where is it here? Plant up here, uh, animal, uh, right border, left border, and our gene of interest. All right, in this case with the 35S uh, promoter from cauliflower mosaic virus. All right, uh, this one, uh, our selectable marker here, uh, this is a herbicide resistance gene. Uh, and then this is a potato uh, protease inhibitor gene. You know, intron and a promoter uh, as well to get high level of expression. Note there's no tDNA uh, borders, so this would be a plasmid used in the biolistic method. All right, any questions about insect resistance? All right, so did I scare you away from eating uh, hamburger helper because it contains uh, soybeans that are probably BT or your Doritos? Eee, my Doritos have BT toxin in it. Uh, the, the government, in its infinite wisdom, uh, classifies the BT protein as a chemical insecticide. And so it's handled like uh, all the other chemical insecticides by the EPA which sort of boggles the mind, but that's how it happens. All right, uh, virus resistance strategies, there's a bunch of different ways here. Um, the, the one way that, uh, where we have a uh, demonstration that it is a, a uh, what, viable resistance strategy is the top one here. Some of these others, I think, have uh, potential uh, <coughs> potential uh, uh, resistance uh, in the future, maybe, especially the miRNAs, but uh, they're much newer. So let's look at viral coat protein mediated uh, virus protection. Now, there's a number of plants that uh, have been engineered uh, to contain a viral coat protein to make them resistant to virus. And I think of these uh, only papaya, uh, and squash in the U.S., rice maybe in other parts of the world, but uh, papaya and squash 
uh, are genetically modified and are commercially available. All right, so the strategy is to stick in a coat protein gene. Now, one of the problems with doing that is that in many cases, plant viruses have a uh, multi, uh, you know, part genome. It's not a single, you know, chunk of nucleic acid. Uh, there may be multiple RNAs that make up the genome, and so you have to sort of sort through, find out you know, which RNA actually uh, encodes the coat protein, and then uh, because it's an RNA, you have to convert it into cDNA, clone it, and uh, then you know, express it in the, move it into the plant and express it. All right. Now, in uh, the field, similar to what we talked about with the Bt uh, transgenic tomatoes, where you have multiple insect pests potentially present, the same thing is true with viruses, all right, that uh, your field crops are often affected by more than one type of virus. And again, with these biological systems, uh, they're very specific. Your coat protein is a coat protein for a specific virus. So if you have multiple viruses, you're going to need multiple coat proteins, one for each type of virus. So uh, you're either going to have to transform your plant multiple times, or you transform once and you have multiple coat proteins either on your, your uh, plasma that you uh, shoot into the plants with the gene gun, or you have multiple coat protein genes in your TDNA. And that's uh, sort of what we're looking at here. Lots of colored boxes here. No right border, left border. Uh, so this is the tDNA constructs here. And then uh, we've got our selectable marker, uh, a reporter gene, Gus. And then in these cases, they're either single or uh, two copies of, what is it, CMV is cucumber mosaic virus. WMV is the watermelon mosaic virus and uh, CYM is the zucchini yellow mosaic virus, <coughs> all right? So the top one has uh, you know, coat proteins for you know, two different, well, two different viruses. The second one has coat proteins for two different viruses, and the bottom one has coat proteins for three different viruses. All right, <clears throat> so here we're looking at results um, where plants uh, were, were applying the severe symptoms up to 100% versus days after planting. The wild type is the red line, so in about, what, 35 or so days, uh, all the plants have severe symptoms. If we transform in one uh, of the coat protein genes, uh, it's basically the same thing, 35 to 45 days afterward. Uh, all the plants have severe symptoms. Uh, but if we put both in, it's the bottom line here on the x-axis. None of the plants are showing symptoms at all. all right. Very effective way of uh, protecting uh, plants. Um, I mentioned squash is on the market, also papaya. The papaya ring spot virus uh, years ago uh, practically uh, demolished the Hawaiian uh, papaya industry. And when they moved the coat protein from the ring spot virus into the papaya trees, they became resistant to the virus, and that allowed the Hawaiian papaya industry to uh, reestablish itself. Uh, although I don't think the, the papayas we get around here aren't from Hawaii. I think they're from uh, Central America, Honduras, or somewhere. All right, um, I'm gonna skip uh, these others, just different ways of, of trying to uh, prevent the virus from establishing an, an infection, typically by preventing replication from occurring in, in one fashion or another. Um, let's jump through that. Let's go to bacterial and fungal resistance. All right, so this is a, a little bit different and a little bit harder to deal with as well, uh, but you know, a serious problem. Uh, the fungal rice blast causes $5 billion in losses. 
So if you can prevent um, you know, those sorts of diseases, it's a you know, great boom to farmers. And also, you know, because there are larger crops, the cost goes down to some extent, and you know, that benefits consumers as well. All right, now, um, you know, prior to uh, genetic modification, you have to use some sort of chemical agent, and you know, fungicides typically aren't very effective at treating plants. Uh, it just, you know, they're not very effective at treating uh, human fungal diseases either. And you know, some of these are going to persist and potentially damage the environment as well, contaminate water supplies and stuff. All right, uh, another really bad one is uh, this wheat rust called UG99, uh, stem rust fungus. Uh, this is resistant to the three major anti-rust genes that are used in all of the world's wheat. All right, um, you know, up to 70% crop loss in fields that are infected. Uh, it's called UG99 because it was discovered in Uganda in 1999. Since then, it spread to Ethiopia, uh, Sudan, and Yemen by 2006, 2007, discovered in Iran, 2009, in South Africa. That was the last data. So, uh, <clears throat> Uganda in here, you know, 99, and then you know, spread uh, upwards in this direction. 2003, 2006, 2007, 2009, and down in this direction, 2009. Uh, the really bad areas uh, that we're concerned about, the dark red areas, and basically all of Europe. All right? And then when it jumps across the ocean, yeah. So people are, are pretty concerned about this and are trying to you know, do something. If you like bread like I do, then you know this is a concern. All right, now how do we uh, attack fungal and bacterial uh, <clears throat> infections? And plants have a natural defense mechanism. We don't really you know think about it quite that way, but it's referred to as systemic acquired resistance (SAR). And <clears throat> the when when plants are are damaged in some way. Uh, and insect predation also can elicit this sort of response. Uh, there's a signal from uh, salicylate, right, like aspirin, uh, salicylate, uh, and this turns on antifungal, antibacterial enzymes, typically that are called uh, PR proteins for pathogenesis related. Most of these are uh, enzymes that will break down cell walls of fungus and bacteria, Others are protease inhibitors, right? So the idea is, well, can we uh, enhance this system using molecular techniques in some way uh, to overexpress salicylate to turn the genes on faster or turn them on at higher levels uh, or turn them on under different sorts of uh, you know, fungal or bacterial infections? So overexpress salicylate or to alter expression of this master regulator of, of SARS, sort of the idea where people are going. And this is one case where the biology is not necessarily specific uh, in that you know, you're turning on lots of different genes that will affect lots of different bacteria and fungi. All right. uh, so graphically, this is sort of what we're looking at. So here's the, the plant. Uh, if the fungus or bacteria affect the roots, the stems, or the leaves, you're going to elicit production of uh, salicylic, salicylic acid, uh, which is uh, the inducer of these PR proteins. All right, and that will lead to uh, you know, resistance to the fungal and, and bac bacteria, at least in some cases. All right, so how do we get salicylate? All right. uh, it's uh, made uh, from precursors uh, of tryptophan, uh, charismate, uh, and a couple of enzymes can lead to production of salicylate. So if we're engineering a plant, we can do metabolic uh, engineering, add these two enzymes that are bacterial genes, and essentially you know, put salicylate control under the control of promoters for these two, right? So we can modify things and potentially 
um, you know, express these at higher levels to get a lot more salicylate at the beginning, all right, and lead to greater production of those pathogenesis-related proteins and nip the uh, fungal or bacterial expression in, in, uh, in the bud, so to speak, limited before it gets established. Uh, other strategies are, are to look at what those PR proteins are and overexpress those. Again, glutenases, chitinases, lysosomes, things that are going to break down the, the cell wall and prevent growth. All right. Okay. Any questions on that? Yes. The plant would evolve at the same time while the bacteria and our and and the fungus are. Like being um, selecting for the salicylate. So, what is the effect of the plant? You also well, evolve it. Yeah, you know, think about that for a minute. You're talking about a bacterium that might have a, a generation time of, of you know, 30 minutes versus you know, an oak tree. What's the generation time? 10 years. So, you know, who's going to win? Yeah. So yes, they are co-evolving, but not at the same rate. But also from the previous years, from ever since the evolution of the plant. Yeah, but, but who's evolving faster? The bacteria. Yeah. All right. It's like you know us using chemicals on bacteria. Who's going to win? Bacteria. Yeah. But Otherwise, we wouldn't have to develop new antibiotics or new chemical, uh, you know, insecticides or pesticides. I'm thinking of another uh, another metabolic pathway other than salicylate. So if there, is yeah, there are other um, you know other pathways that will elicit uh, other sorts of responses. Um, I think plants, some plants um, will produce volatile compounds like jasminate, and that that's how. <clears throat> Neighboring trees will start to respond before they uh, experience, uh, say, insect predation, because the, the tree that's being eaten by the gypsy moth is eliciting these volatile signaling molecules that waft over and elicit responses in the other plants. But you know that's basically, uh, you know, it's basically the same thing as the uh, salicylate pathway. But I don't think those others fall into this systemic acquired response. You know, I, I don't think they're eliciting um, you know, this, the same sort of uh, like resistance response that the salicylate pathway does. But you're right, there are other sorts of pathways that do allow plants to respond, but um, not quite in exactly the same way. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about herbicide resistance. All right. um, herbicide resistance is sort of like uh, you know, the, the uh, insect and, and fungus. Uh, estimated loss is 10% of global crop production. All right. uh, and again, 10 billion spent on more than 100 chemical herbicides. So this is like insecticides, you know, all these uh, chemical herbicides, you use them, what's going to happen? Plants are going to become resistant, all right? And then what do you do? Develop a stronger one, right? Uh, and you know, with some of these, there's if they're used incorrectly, and sometimes in cases even when they're used correctly, uh, there may be significant environmental damage, pollution of uh, you know, contamination of soil, pollution of water, things like that. Uh, so what ideally we want to do is to make plants resistant to herbicides that are more environmentally friendly so that we can develop chemicals that will target uh, you know, weeds, plants in general, but we will endow specific crop plants with the resistant to that particular herbicide. But the herbicide will be environmentally friendly. It won't persist in the soil, it won't contaminate water, it won't kill birds and humans and cause cancer and all those sorts of nasty things. All right, yeah, this, again, sort of a complicated slide here, but there are a number of ways of thinking about how to make a plant resistant to a herbicide. Again, 
you know, herbicides are going to kill plants, so we need to endow the plant the ability to resist that particular uh, chemical. Number one is inhibit the uptake of the herbicide. If the herbicide can't get in, it's not going to kill the plant. Right? Not necessarily easy to do. Uh, overproduce the herbicide sensitive target protein. So if the herbicide binds to a particular protein and inhibits it, well, if you make 10 times as much of that particular protein, it's probably going to survive the, uh, you know, the herbicide action, unless you know, some farmer misreads the label and sprays 10 times as much herbicide on the field. Hey, if you need laugh, it happens. Uh, <clears throat> all right, uh, the third bullet point here, add a gene uh, from bacteria, fungus, some other source that is insensitive to the herbicide but performs the same biochemical reactions to target protein. Basically, what we talk about, uh, you know, in terms of getting around feedback inhibition. So here we stick in a, uh, a an enzyme that carries out the same uh, function, the same biochemical reaction as the target protein for the herbicide, but it, this one doesn't interact with the herbicide. All right, and so the plant is resistant. All the other uh, weeds and stuff are going to to die. Number four here, reduce the ability of the herbicide-sensitive target protein to bind the herbicide, right? Do site-directed mutagenesis. Alter the, uh, uh, the binding site where the herbicide binds, don't change any of the other properties of the, the protein. And the last one is, is uh, one of the, the strategies, uh, the other one is up here at the top, the second bullet point, uh, but the last one, endow plants with the ability to metabolically inactivate the herbicide. All right, so you know, it's, it's basically the same thing as an antibiotic resistance gene. Right? You add phosphate to neomycin and it's no longer active. All right? Well, if we add an enzyme that's going to do something, oxidize, cleave the herbicide, then you know, plants will be res resistant to the herbicide, weeds won't be. All right. All right. Uh, there are lots of different herbicides that farmers use. Uh, there's a, a, an abbreviated list here. Uh, and uh, mode of resistance, these are basically examples of what we talked about before for triazines, uh, which atrazine is one of the nasties that contaminates soil and pollutes water supplies. So this, you know, if you want to get rid of a herbicide, this would be one of them to get rid of. Uh, alteration of the uh, PSBA, which is chloroplast gene, codes the target of the herbicide. So you change it a little bit, the herbicide doesn't bind, so the plant is resistant. Sulfonyl ureas, uh, genes encoding resistant versions of this acetolactate synthase are transformed in basically the same thing. Glyphosate, overproduction of the EPSPS or glyphosate oxidoreductase. Uh, so you either overproduce the target or you can uh, add in an enzyme that's going to degrade the herbicide. Right. And same here with the phenoxycarboxylic acids, which is uh, 2,4-D or wheat be gone that is available at your local uh, Home Depot or, or Lowe's. Uh, and here you transform in a gene from a different organism that degrades the herbicide. All right, and just a couple examples here. Um, so glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, relatively simple sort of molecule, but uh, this uh, N-acetyltransferase adds an acetyl group to it and activates it. You know, relatively straightforward, you know, simple sort of chemical reaction. Uh, dicamba is an odd one that was mentioned before, but here uh, the uh, the herbicide resistance gene is an oxygenase, so you oxidize dicamba into uh, this other compound and again eliminates its uh, activity. And uh, a nitrolase here where you oxidize this uh, carbon-nitrogen linkage and go from an active version of the herbicide to an inactive version. So it's relatively, uh, relatively straightforward. All right, add a gene uh, to in some way allow the plant to escape the herbicide activity. Weeds don't have that gene, and so the weeds will die. All right, now one of the goals, uh, of course, is to sort of reduce herbicide uh, use, 
uh, or at least, and I think this is the point that a lot of people don't um, you know, sort of latch on to, uh, if you're not necessarily going to reduce herbicide usage, at least shift to something that's more environmentally friendly. Now, I'm not saying that glyphosate is uh, environmentally friendly, but uh, you know, hopefully in future generations of herbicides will be. So if you look at the acreage uh, that's planted uh, you know, with uh, biotech uh, crops, it sort of mirrors glyphosate usage because what are you planting? You know, primarily Roundup Ready, uh, you know, soybeans, cotton, and now corn as well. All right, and other herbicides? Yay, we're getting rid of some of these, quote, bad ones. Right? like the triazines, atrazine and others. So, you know, the, the idea sort of works. Uh, of course, you know, who makes glyphosate? On Satan, yes. <laughs> so everybody is uh, against this whole idea because look who's making it. Um, I think it's off patent now, so everybody can make it. All right, um, I am basically out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. We'll pick up with uh, these environmental stresses and then